Again, I want to come back to Johannes Schlegel and his collecting of the so-called fetishes, because he and his collection might help to answer this question. What Schlegel actually is doing um, by collecting this item and not that item, I mean, as a missionary, he could have collected many items, but he decided to take this item and not that item. Um, by collecting and making this decision, which is a non-explicit decision, but which is a decision, um, and by um, ascribing to the one object a particular meaning, and this particular meaning in general is, as you can see here, that these objects are fetish, that these objects are uh, belonging to a magical religion, that these objects are uh, belonging to a superstitious religion. And uh, you see this as well, this is a photograph taken in India, and uh, it is as well um, done in order to show that this is uh, a religion which is in Christian terms, superstition, magic, and therefore not a real, uh, in Christian terms, religion. That means each, co each collecting yeah, and ascribing meaning uh, is as well, and this is, I think, uh, the main thing, is as well uh, drawing boundaries. That means drawing the boundary between the magical, the superstitious, the secular, and what the Christians call the religious, and what the Christians call the religious is only Christian religion. I mean, this is what they call religion. That means the first thing, what, what happens, or the, or the minor structure, structural feature of all these knowledge producing operations is making boundaries. Missionaries in their daily work, first of all, were engaged in boundary work. They helped to come to a new understanding of, of how and um, by what the civilized, that means the real religious, was separated from the primitive, that means the superstitious or the magical. And that means how um, us differed from then and how the Christian and the non-Christian world, as well in a broader sense, the religious and the secular was to be defined. Each description and each collection of a fetish shaped and then reshaped the domains of what is supposed to belong to the religious sphere on the one hand and what's to be defined as magic on the other hand. To be short, the most momentous result of these core missionary activities contributing to mission and religious studies as well as to anthropology and at the same time, reaching beyond these disciplines was the new borders drawn within everything but clear arena of the secular, religious, and the superstitious. And I know very well that, uh, or as far as understood, in, in Japan, um, there is another kind of ordering, uh, which is not like this one, what the Christian missionaries really did. Uh, as far as I understood, and in Japan, in these contexts, there's other, there are other ordering categories. Um, but this is what, what was at the heart of the activities of uh, the missionaries. And each these display of so-called fetishes in a museum, or yun zoos, and missionary exhibitions, as well as each picture representing these objects, spread the missionary meaning ascribed to these objects. The way they were displayed, these objects, and represented, helped to promote the missionary definition of the religious and the non-religious, intensifying the experience of the boundaries established by these fetish, so easily surmounting the narrow circles of academia. And at the same time, fetishes displayed in exhibitions produced a particular vision of a supposedly exotic world far away from Europe, and they also shaped the visitors' ideas, feelings, and opinion 
let alone the leaves concerning his or her own world. And this knowledge, a particular Christian European knowledge of defining the sacral and religious, um, is of um, crucial importance, I think, until today when we come to academic life. Uh, and we see that if we have a, a closer look into religious studies, or if we have a closer look into anthropology, where we still, until today, see this, this um, missionary um, uh, impregnation of, um, of this um, boundary work. Um, okay, I want to uh, finally come to an end, and um, I try to uh, enrich our picture of how missionaries contributed to globalized knowledge, and this importance of globalized knowledge, because they were a global place, it's not something what they thought in their, these missionaries was not only important for the missionaries, it, it was something which was spread in the, in the, global, in the global sense. Um, how they contributed to a globalized knowledge by showing how two different and at the same time entangled kinds of knowledge which circulated on a transnational and sometimes on a global level emerged out of the daily missionary work. Even though the one is more restricted to the academic area, intentionally enriching the scholarly field, while the other is reaching a broader public, both are emerging out of the daily religious work. Um, and what then is um, understood as religious, as secular, um, uh, is uh, is something which is done by these uh, by these missionaries in um, their um, in their daily work. There's four points I want to uh, conclude with, uh, just to summarize and to get the, the, the main um, the main points. It's not only, and I think not primarily, that missionaries added knowledge to the world of botany, geology, zoological studies, or linguistics, which is very important, but this is not the only field. First of all, they help to promote a new and very specific Christian way of knowledge about what is religious and what is superstitious and what is secular. And second, they could spread this not new knowledge throughout the world because they were global players, perhaps the first global players ever, and surely at, in, at least in 19th century, the most important ones. This knowledge, the report, was an outcome of the daily work. It was nothing which they explicitly did in order to produce knowledge. Uh, it was an outcome of the daily work, and it was narrowly connected uh, and a prerequisite of their main task of bringing the gospel, not an at all. Something which only can, uh, can, you, can become visible when we do not separate knowledge production from religious making, uh, but see them as interconnected in one analytical plan. And fourth, the knowledge written down in scholarly articles and books and uh, exhibited in museums is also connected um, to the not less globally spread information called propaganda um, gained also uh, out of the daily work but addressing a much larger public, including various layers of the society. And the interesting thing is when we come to, to nowadays, we see um, that the missionaries um, have been, yeah, are not only part of the academic knowledge field, at least in Europe and at least in the United States and in England, as well as in Asia, the missionaries are somehow, they, they, they are somehow 
have been marginalized in this academic knowledge field at the beginning of the 20th century, around 1910, 1920, one can really see how they were, um, how they somehow really were marginalized in this field. And this was also because it was not thought what they were doing is religion and what academia is doing uh, is now part of the secular world. That means their own um, boundary making, their own kind of dividing the world, um, yeah, let somehow as well to their expulsion of the academic world, which nowadays is conceived as something secular, at least in, in most of the <coughs> Western uh, countries. Uh, I think there are some other countries uh, which don't see that this way, but, but at least in these countries. And therefore, um, they somehow, the missionaries are victims, if you want so, of their own boundary making, um, if you think it is, uh, it is to be praised to be part of that. 